Well, today's episode is one that I've been looking forward to for a long time. It's with actually one of my best friends. Her name is Kate Geller. Kate has a podcast called Shame on Shame. She's also on Instagram and TikTok as Kate on Shame. Some of you may know her already from social media. I am so honored to bring Kate to you guys on the podcast today because I have watched Kate go through a lot of this process that she's going to talk to you about on overcoming shame, speaking it, releasing it, helping others get through their shame by healing yourself. So freaking cool. She has been, I mean, she has gone from like addiction and she'll, I'll let her, I won't spoil everything, but being really deep in the throes of addiction to gaining a bunch of weight after that addiction and didn't having to go through that whole process to all of the internal healing. She talks about some of the best modalities that she has found in her journey for overcoming these self-defeating, self-limiting thoughts to put it, (laughs) to kind of understate it, you know, like, and she is in such a beautiful place now. I am so freaking proud of her. She's so smart and intelligent and fun to listen to. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode. And I also hope that you check out her podcast, the shame on shame podcast. It is by far, not just because she's one of my friends, like just in general, truly, it is one of the most enjoyable podcasts I've ever listened to. She is made for this. So I hope you guys enjoy. And I hope as you listen to this, that you dig in a little bit and think about what things in your life that you have shame about. And I hope that you can like take a little bit of hope from Kate's journey and start applying some of the things she's talking about. So you can get past that because you don't deserve to live in shame. It's not fair. It is not fair to you. And as you heal that part of yourself, you will naturally become a healer to those around you. So let's go ahead and dive in. This was such a fun and enjoyable episode. I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I did. Here is Kate Geller. Okay, guys. So I'm bringing you one of my best friends, Kate Geller. Uh, I, you know, a lot of people have been talking to me about my episode with Aaron lately, Kate, you know, so you guys know, Aaron, me, Aaron and Kate are really, really good friends. We probably text each other every day. And I'm so proud of my friends that they have such awesome stories to tell that I can bring them on my pad- podcast. And it's, I hope I know it's going to inspire a lot of you guys, especially this one, Kate, your story is freaking insane and so cool. I was literally, we were texting this morning. I was literally on t- in tears. I was in yeah, tears. I couldn't even, I could not even finish the message because I was like, girl, that's so freaking beautiful. It's so needed what you're doing. And so Thank if you guys you. don't know, Kate, I've been sharing on social, but Kate has a podcast called shame on shame and on Instagram, she's Kate on shame. And we're going to talk about shame today in this episode. And I guess, you know, I'll let, I, I want to tell so many things, but I'll, I'll let you talk. (laughs) Well, first of all, Tara, like I told you this morning, this episode means so much to me beyond words. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have been there for me just as a friend feeling through this journey with me, not just like listening, not just saying, you know, I'm proud of you. Good job. But you have felt this journey with me. And so I wouldn't be here without you. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing without you, without Aaron. I mean, you guys are my ride or dies. So (laughs) yes. Thank you. Kate. It's been such a, it's been so awesome. It's like, it's our, it's our honor. It's our pleasure. Cause it's just been so cool to to go through this journey because when we met what at KetoCon, like this was only what, like three years ago, two, it was like, it was like two and a half. It was like two and a half years ago. Yeah. Not that long. What you said to me, do you remember in the coffee shop? Yes. I was at, yeah, I was at a very low point when you and I met, um, I had lost about 35 pounds. So just for context, I am in recovery from an addiction to alcohol and Adderall. And so in the aftermath of getting sober, I gained 65 pounds. And I'm five foot one. So that's like, that really, really shows. I went from a healthy weight to obese in only a few years. Yeah. And so you met me because I was working for a keto company and I had sort of fallen into this job and it became my answer. It became what sort of took me off on my weight loss journey. Yeah. So you and I met, I had lost 35 pounds, but I was still coming off of medications Mm -hmm. that I was put on when I was getting sober. So you met me at this time when I was trying to figure out literally the chemicals of my body, like how to regulate my system. Totally. And 
I mean, I remember, so we went to this coffee shop and you and Aaron, I mean, so you guys went to the conference the whole time through, like you guys attended it. I was in bed for the majority of the conference because I was having medication issues, withdrawals, um, fatigue. And one of the days that I did manage to get out of bed, we all went to coffee and you guys sat me down and you guys said, Kate, you're special. Like you need to have a YouTube show. You need to have like a podcast. Like you are special. Your story is special. We see something. Yeah. And that was one of the first times that someone had said that to me who wasn't a mental health professional. (laughs) And I just remember you said, you guys said that to me. I felt so seen and I just started crying. Yeah. Yeah. That I I just have to say, like, that was actually an influencer. That was after I had met you because you met me you actually hired me as a coach. And I was like, this girl is cool as shit. Like I love her. And I did. I always saw that in you. I always saw that in you. So this was like a little bit later, I think like October of that year or something. And I was like, dude, I knew it. I felt it like in every, just the resonance of my soul. I was like, this girl's got a freaking message. This mm-hmm. she, and, and you guys will see as we go through this episode, you're like, you, you're one of your gifts is just your voice. And you're so <laughs> like, fun and funny and just enjoyable to listen to and watch. And Thank it's just like you. all so perfect, but let's take people back a little bit. Let's help them. Yeah. Get we a, just jumped into it. We yeah. Just let's help, Cause like, you're, you're right, man. Like I think back to that influencer conference. I remember you coming in and out. I mean, it's hard to believe that that was you. Cause you were just, I, I know you were still in the thick of it, you know, yeah. like I, you could tell in your, in your being, you know, and for anybody, the reason I was crying this morning is because like, mental health issues in like addiction and all the stuff that happens during that phase of life. Nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to. And and I'm so grateful to you that you're willing to share your story and be brave and courageous so that other people can heal, you know, because unless people have been through it, do that. It's just, there's shame, right? So let's start there. Like, can you talk a little bit more about what you went through your story? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for that. My admiration for you, it's all mutual, but that goes without saying. So yeah. Okay. So for me, shame started at a very young age. I was very severely bullied in kindergarten. Okay. So it starts off like juvenile shame and it escalates in my journey. So I was bullied in kindergarten. So that was like the first time that feelings of inadequacy were kind of seated in me. And then two years later, I was held up at gunpoint with my father outside of our home garage. And I watched my dad get beaten. Um, I watched my dad just unable to protect me. So from there, I mean, it wasn't his fault, but from there I developed this like belief of being unlovable or being unsafe. Okay. Then in middle school, a few years later, I was literally tormented by mean girls. I grew up in LA. I went to an all girls private school full of celebrities, kids, and I was, I was bullied. So those are my first three instances of shame. Yeah. And those three instances created this deep seated desire to find acceptance, to be, um, wanted to be cool. I always wanted to be cool. Right. And so that led me on this path of underage drinking um, experimenting with drugs. And what was weird about me was I was like this straight A student. I was Mm. on student council overachiever. And oftentimes shame manifests as perfectionism because you're trying to cover up all the, like how shitty you feel inside. Am I allowed to swear? Yes, definitely. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So I had two sides of the shame spectrum. I had this perfectionism, but then I also had this, like, I want to be cool. I want to numb out side. So it was this weird dichotomy. Right. Yeah. Um, and then after college, so in college, I was friends with all these models. I was friends with all these, I went to NYU. So I was in New York in this like celeb, like just really like cool culture. Right. And I became the funny girl. I became the girl who drank too much, told jokes and the attention and praise that being funny got me Right, just led me to drink more and do more crazy, outrageous stuff. Right. right? This makes me lovable and likable and safe and accepted. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm the funny girl. They accept me. They rely on me for jokes. It's everything I wanted as a kid. Yep. But eventually these habits became 
self-destructive. They became um, things that my body actually it got to a point where I needed alcohol. I And Adderall came yeah. into play because I was prescribed Adderall for ADHD. Adderall, I, I'm sorry for shaming people who take Adderall. <laughs> I hate Adderall. I am like on a mission to tell people that, okay? Yeah, we'll get into but, it. Like yeah. what happened? Yeah. yeah. Why you feel that way? Yeah. Why I feel that way. Well, there's a lot there. Um, but eventually it got to a point where these two things were my crutch and I was in a cycle of drinking and then taking Adderall to yeah. sober up and then right. drinking. Cause I felt like such right. a robot from the Adderall. Right. And then, so it was this weird cycle and I ended up a bunch of other things happened. My boyfriend died. I mean, it was like, are you sick of my shit? But it was like trauma after trauma after trauma. And I ended yeah. up in a psychosis. Yeah. Um, her, you slipped past that one real quick, but yeah, your boyfriend died uh, all during this time period. I mean, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah. My boyfriend of eight years died when I was 22 years old. We were like high school sweethearts. Like we were right. like, thought we were going to get married and right. he died. And so that's when I entered into that cycle of Adderall, alcohol, Adderall, alcohol, yeah. because I, that was what I did. And it yeah. made me forget what was happening. Right. It made me forget yep. everything. I know there's so many people on that boat. I know yeah. there's so many people that can relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, the more I talk about it, the more I see Adderall as a crutch for people with drinking problems because Adderall mm. makes you high functioning. Right. It makes your brain, it's an amphetamine, which right. meth is an amphetamine. Right. So it's like, you know, there's like a relationship between cocaine and heroin where it's like one's a downer, one's an right. upper, one's a downer one. Right. That's what it was for me. It was just totally. two different things. Totally. So eventually, you know, it came to a point um, where I was in that psychosis that I just um, mentioned. I was in the psych ward. I was in a psych ward three times in only six weeks, three times in six weeks. Um, I was on like a 5150 lockdown, which means you're in like the lockdown unit. You have, you know, um, your arms and legs are strapped down. I mean, it's, Great, I man. Yeah. I had bruises on my wrist, bruises on my legs for weeks after that. It was awful. And in that psych ward, I had the realization. I was just like, I need to get myself out of this. Like, this is not me. I'm not supposed to be here. Yeah. This, you know, right. And I wanted someone to turn to so badly when I was in there, this moment happened in the psych ward. I was trying to think of someone to give me hope who has gone through this and who is talking about this. Right. And I couldn't think of anyone. Wow. Damn. Yeah. I felt like that when I was leaving Mormonism, I was kind of like, are there any, like, like, I don't want to like, just look at these people who like, they hate Mormons and like, all this. I was like, are there like any normal people who like went through this, you know, and it caused yeah. me to make a video about it on YouTube. So I can see why you're doing what you're doing. Cause you're like, dude, there was like no healthy, happy, normal person to turn right. to who's been through what I've been through. Like, show me some humanity here. Like I have no model, no example, no hope, no, exactly. you know, nothing. Yeah. And with, the, with the Mormonism and you, you and I have talked about this a lot. The reason why people don't speak up about these things is because Dang. they're afraid of being judged. Yep. You know, they're also yep. afraid to face it themselves. Right. Like admit it themselves, but also like, I'm sure I've been judged by like a hundred people for saying my story. Yes, you, know? you get it every day now, don't you? We'll get, I get there it every we, day to give a little more picture of this. I don't know if we'll cut this out if you're not a, a comfortable with it, but like, yeah. would you mind sharing the coffee story? The oh, burn? yes. So yes, people can yes, get a yes. picture of like where you were. Yeah, at this time. yeah. 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 So because you guys are seeing like, you know, healed Kate <laughs> on her journey to help people. But like, I want you to imagine, try to imagine this and then later gaining 65 pounds. Like, dude, you've been through like some serious phases, you know, to yeah. get to where you're at now. So, yeah. I mean, I often say that physically I've lived in the world as six different people Yeah, because yeah. wherever I was in my life, totally manifested on my body and changed yeah. the way that I looked. Um, Amen for everyone, for everyone, for yeah. everyone. I mean, you can see what someone's insides often look like, you know, yeah. that's it, a it generalization. Just, that's it, a general. And it's, and it's, and it's also just from a place of compassion. You know what I mean? When we're suffering, our physiology suffers. Right. So, 
That's a way better way to put it. That's a way better way to put it. And cancel what I said before (laughs) about like what someone looks like being a reflection of how they are on the inside. I don't mean that, but what I do mean is that- I know what you mean. I know it's true. It's true. Just want to make sure people have that compassion on themselves with that. Like, you know, but yeah. No, that's really well said with the physiology. Um, But yeah, okay. So there was a period in my life before going into the psych ward where I was covered in scabs. So before the coffee incident, I'm just going to say I was covered in scabs from Adderall. So already I look like that because what Adderall made me do was it made me pick at my skin unconsciously. So I was wearing like turtlenecks in the summertime, sweating, feeling so uncomfortable in my skin. Right. Cause I didn't want, I had so much shame about my socks. Yeah. Yeah. (sighs) but during this time I had a very severe burn accident, um, which destroyed my skin even further. So one morning I was, it was like the morning after I had been partying, I had gone out for Cinco de Mayo and I was in my friend's kitchen and I went to go make coffee using a French press. And so if you're familiar with a French press, like what you do is you put the coffee grounds in, then you put in boiling water and then you push down a plunger. Okay. I was so drunk from the night before that instead of pushing down the plunger and letting it like absorb the coffee into the water, I plunged it like it was a toilet plunger. (laughs) Like I just plunged this French press up and down the scalding boiling hot water splashed on my face. I had, I think it was like second degree burns. Um, Actually, I have an entire podcast episode about this. It's Mm. my third episode of my podcast. It's called the real story of how I gained weight. Mm. So if you're interested in that, check that episode out. But um, so anyways, the coffee grounds got in my hair. They were melting my hair. So I'm still drunk. And I end up deciding, you know what? I can fix this situation if I just cut off the melted parts of my hair. And long story short, I continued drinking while I was trying to fix my hair. I ended up with no hair by the end of this, literally like Britney Spears, I had no hair. And I just remember looking in the mirror after that moment and it makes me emotional. It's hard to even talk about, but I looked in the mirror and I was just like, I'm a monster. I'm literally a monster. I'm, I do not look like how a human being is supposed to look. I mean, covered in scabs, no hair, just gone pale from just Adderall, alcohol, Adderall, alcohol. And from there, I just, I just hated myself. I thought the only thing I would ever know, and I'm sorry if this is really dark compared to your normal episodes, but I thought the only thing I would ever know was pain. Yeah. Yeah. So much compassion for that girl, you know, thank you, thank you for sharing that. Cause as you know, cause you're, you've become a voice now, you know, there's many people in this place and yeah. how sad and all they need healing so much healing. Yeah. And I appreciate you sharing that because like, who wants to talk about that story? Nobody, nobody, nobody does, <laughs> but, I'll, but I'll tell you what happens when you do talk about it. When you do talk about it, you start to cultivate acceptance, right? And in acceptance, you find self-forgiveness. And so for me, telling these stories, telling the story I just told you, it's still hard. I've told that story 50 times, but publicly too, but it's still hard. But I, I've, I've come to accept it and I've come to forgive myself and I've come to see it as a point of strength as something that makes me strong. Cause I've been through that and look at me now. Yeah. Yes. It like, I, you know, I know I've quoted this on the podcast before, but I really love Brene Brown's quote about, she says, I'm paraphrasing, but she says you need three things in a Petri dish for shame to grow exponentially. And it's secrecy, silence, and judgment. It's true. Meaning you feel like if you ever tell anybody this thing, yeah. you're going to be judged like crazy. Or you, maybe you do tell one person and they judge you like crazy. She's like, that will actually like ricochet someone back into shame and you know, oh, go, ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, it's so funny. You say that because I get a lot of people reaching out to me on social and they're like, you know, 
I, my whole message is talk about your shame, yes. find yeah. safe people, find yes. a safe community. Don't yes. go around like dumping it on people, right. but find the right people. Yes. Right. And then you learn to own it. You learn yes. just like, I, I own that story. I own it, you know? Right. So, um, what's funny is that a lot of people reach out to me on social and they say, you know, I want to do what you're doing. I want to tell my story, but people judge me and people are mean to me and people don't want to talk to me anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's a real thing. Yeah, it's it's a real thing. So it's really about finding those safe communities yes. and those safe people. Right. Yeah, I, I echo that so much because sometimes it can be tempting to like once you open up about it, you feel so liberated. You want to like keep telling it over and over and over. But yeah. it is, you know, I, and Brene talks about that and Daring Greatly, too. It's like eh, sometimes that can be an overcompensation of just dumping it on everyone. Cause you want right. to be liberated from it, but it's being mindful of that. And I mean, even you, you have told these stories a bunch of times before yeah. you created the podcast and went on social media about it. Like you had a lot of experience talking about it before then. I mean, and there's some new stuff that you're sharing on your podcast, which by the way, guys, her podcast is so freaking good. Thank it is you. so good. It's like, you will, you know how sometimes you don't want to finish listening to a podcast. You like, you don't ever want to stop listening to Kate's <laughs> podcast. You. She puts so much work into it and you're just, yeah, yeah you just have that gift. Oh, but thank you. It's thank even you. still though. I'm sure it's still like it's, I know it is because we talk about it. It's vulnerable. You know, it's like, shit, is somebody, is that gonna, is somebody going to get upset about that part and blah, blah, blah. And people, you know, people coming at you at all different angles, you're yeah. opening up about drunk driving. And then that's a whole <laughs> new thing. It's like, Ooh, shame on you, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, no, it's it, true. It's takes a lot of courage. What would you recommend to somebody who like, they've got that thing, right? Like the very first episode of this podcast was Amber Sears, JP Sears wife. And mm. I remember her saying on that episode, like that she had bulimia for a really long time. And she had this boyfriend. It wasn't, it was before JP, but she had this boyfriend. She, he didn't even know she was hiding it from her boyfriend Wow, who she lived with. You know what I mean? And she's like, the only thing that ever released me, the only way I ever got into healing was I finally told my boyfriend what was yeah. going on. Yeah. So, you know, like, dude, <laughs> you, you know, have to as speak it to heal it. You have to speak yeah. it to heal it. Yeah. And, you know, I found a safe community. I mean, I found a safe community in the keto community. I, I mean, that's where I first started telling my story, honestly. Yeah. And it's not necessarily keto. It's just like a health minded community because right. people in health tend to be very prideful and open about the things they've overcome because yeah. they want to share that with other people. Right. They want to help. Right. Right. Yeah. So it wasn't yeah. like I was going to a dinner party and telling that story, right. yeah. you know, yeah. I was at a place with people like you and with people right. like Aaron and people who are driven by the notion of self-improvement. Yeah. That's really wise. Okay. I wanted also for you to share like you've done a lot of healing modalities, like a lot, like you really like searched the full gamut. And I remember you telling me when we were out in Joshua tree one time, some of the things you're like, dude, I, like you're kind of like, you remind me of me with like biohacking. I'm like, let me experiment <laughs> with all of these different modalities for you guys. Yeah. And I'll tell you the ones that like, I personally think, and I've found with clients too, that it's like, this one really helps. This one really helps. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could kind of share some of the healing opportunities, modalities, whatever you want to call them that really turned the needle for you. I know exactly what you're referring to. And I think it is DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy. Is that what, is that what you're referring to? There's, well, I was thinking of a bunch of them. I know okay. like spirituality kind of started to, and I know this one, but anyway, I know you have several. So I was wondering if you could just kind of give us the highlight yeah. reel no, of things that helped you. you. Thank you for asking me that because that's something that I just want to share with everyone. Um, I would say, so starting with the therapeutic, like clinical therapeutic perspective, yeah. I've done CBT, I've done EMDR, I've done everything. DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy was the clinical modality that finally got me to look at my stuff and change it. Okay. Can you describe? DBT? Yeah. So DBT was created by a woman named Marsha Linehan. And what's so funny is Marsha is very into Buddhism and mindfulness. So it's kind of like CBT infused with these like mindful Buddhist principles. Cool. And it's all about self-observation 
and like nice. taking notes about yourself and about your patterns as you move through your day. Nice. So you identify like what your what your what would I don't know the word offhand, but it's like your destructive behaviors yeah. uh-huh. and you have a report card and you fill it out at the end of every day. Like, mm-hmm. oh, you know, I thought like pain is the only way five times today. If that's like your nice. limiting thought. Right. And then you have different behaviors, like mindfulness based activities that you can turn to in the moment that you have that thought Cool. that you act something out. So mm-hmm. Through DBT, I got really interested in Buddhism and mindfulness. Yeah. And I joined a meditation studio. The first year I was sober, I didn't have a job. Like my job was getting my shit together. Like that was my job. And I joined this meditation studio, Tara. I literally went to three to four classes a day. Wow. I mean, and I know not all people have the luxury of taking that time off from life. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have had family support me in doing that. Yeah. But I mean, you don't have to take your entire life off to take up meditation and to join a meditation studio because, you know, it allowed me to observe my thoughts instead of like reacting to all of them. I'm glad that you had the family support to be able to do that because it shows us like, you obviously were, your soul was like, I need this. If you were choosing to spend three or four hours in their day. Yeah. I didn't want to be doing anything else. I mean, the classes at the studio I went to actually, they have courses online. If you want to check it's called den meditation, Den the den, den meditation. So they've become fully virtual since COVID. Cool but they had classes. They blew my mind. There was a class called happiness. And I took a, I took a class called happiness. I cried through the whole thing. And I was like, I want to feel this forever. I want to feel happy like this forever. Shit. That's so awesome. Yeah. Wow. So I would say those two are probably the most effective things I've done. I mean, I've done like hypnosis, I've done Reiki, I've done like somatic healing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, those things work for many people. I would say the things that had the most lasting impact on me were those two things. Mm. Oh, okay. also Tara exposure therapy. What am I talking yeah. about? Yeah. Yeah. Tell so, us about, tell them about that. So, um, When I gained 65 pounds after getting sober, I developed body dysmorphic disorder, which I know so many people have. And as part of that, I became afraid of mirrors and cameras. So I did an exercise in exposure therapy where I made a video of myself every single day, just for myself, like selfie style. And I would watch it back. And through that, I came to understand what I looked like. And really like, I don't know. I remember the first time I watched a video back of myself, I was like, I'm charismatic. Like I'm good to watch, you know? Awesome. So when we slowly expose ourselves to things that cause us shame, or that's the same thing with telling your story. When we slowly expose ourselves to things that scare us or cause us shame or anything like that, we become neutral to them. Yes. You know, I mean, so true. And I'm like, I feel like I do exposure therapy all the time because when I feel that discomfort in something, or I'm like, what if I'm judged or um, it makes me want to do it more because I don't want to feel like that. So like an example, silly example for me would be like, learning how to do a new backwards ladder drill at the gym that I have to be right in the center of the gym. All the treadmills and stair mills and everything are looking at me. I'm right in the middle. I know people can see me. I'm like, literally, I feel like I'm literally on a stage and I'm yeah. messing up over and over and over and over. And I like, I want to do that. Cause I want to feel <laughs> comfortable in myself enough that I am okay sucking at something and learning something in front of other people. Like I it's, I don't know. I just want to feel like that. And I also do, I guess the part of me, because I'm a trainer and so a lot of the people in there know who I am. Like, I, I kind of want to give them permission to do the same. Like it's okay yes. to not know what you're doing and yeah. like mess up and start over. And like, 
I start laughing. Like it's just, it's fun. It's, it almost becomes more fun for me. The more I mess up, I'm like, I'll get it. I'll get it. You know? Right. And so it's kind of like a, a little lifestyle basis of like, even this new app that I've created, it's like, I don't know, I've never done any, a bunch of this stuff before, you know? And it's like, the more you do it, the better you get and the more comfortable right. you get, you know? So I think we can all apply that a little bit. And I love what you just said about like, when you're in the middle of that gym, as a known trainer, right? As someone who's like a fixture there, you're giving other people permission to go in the middle and like mess up too. Yeah. And that's what telling your shame story does as well. Like by being vulnerable, by sharing these hard things, you're creating a safe space for whoever you're talking to, to come back to you and say, Hey, you know, I didn't go through that, but I went through this and you're giving me permission to say that by being brave. Right. And that's probably why you found that in the health community. Like we're all so comfortable with that because we have experienced the darkness. Most of us, you know, like we know what it feels like to feel better. And so we're like, dude, anything I can do, anything I can share that could help you come out of that space into this one. Like, I don't care. I got no ego about it. Like I please know that it's okay. And it's human. Exactly. I also want to ask, cause like, (laughs) I feel like you're like, what do you call yourself a mental health advocate? But I feel like you're like this low key, like mental health expert, really? Like you've just, (laughs) I like asked you for a recommendation on a book about a certain type of shame for a client. And you were like, well, I have one, but it's actually a textbook. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, okay, I'll check it out. You know? So, um, I'm wondering, like, you tell me (laughs) if this applies, but I'm wondering if you could talk about like, like the different common, shame points that you see a lot. Cause now that you're on TikTok and Instagram, like people are messaging you a lot. I know like, yeah. what are some of the biggest shame points that you keep running into? Oh my gosh. Okay. This is such a good question. And it's, it's, it's complicated. I have an episode of my podcast episode two called what is shame anyways. I go through eight different types of shame, the eight different most common types of shame that I think people experience today. Because just as you said, in preparation to release the podcast, like, and I'll answer your question in one second, Tara, but in preparation for releasing the podcast, I was like, okay, so I've been through a ton of shame, but I need to educate myself. So Mm -hmm. I took numerous courses for therapists Um, I read so many clinical books and really just educated myself on what is, what is shame from a clinical perspective. And then I also have the personal experience myself, but I would say like some of the biggest types of shame that I see number one, societal shame, which is the idea that you're not living up to society's standards. Oh God, man. Yes. Holy shit. Like this is like huge. I've been, I've been talking about pressure a lot lately. I'm like, "Eh, Oh my God, I got to start talking about this. It's that's the perfect phrase for it. Societal shame is like, I should be like this. And I'm not fill in the blank is like Mm -hmm. everyone. (laughs) It's everyone. It's everyone. And this type of shame is like social media is king of perpetuating this, especially when it comes to beauty, especially when it comes to where should I be in my life? Right. Should I be married? They're having a kid. Why don't I have a kid? They got a promotion. Why don't I have a promotion? Right. It creates this compare and despair. Yes. I I just had this conversation with a a client this morning about like comparing from a business perspective. Like Mm. this is how all all the other businesses are doing in my industry and I'm here and it creates this like frantic, manic, like not enough, gotta do more, gotta be more like craziness. And I, you know, I'll share real quick. I I'm grateful to my parents because (laughs) I feel like my parents both had pretty low (laughs) self-esteem. I love them so much, but because of that, they, the way they showed up with other people, they were never in a comparing energy. All I observed as a kid was them thinking everyone else was so awesome. So it was in both, my parents were divorced, but they were both like that. So I just would always observe them being like, she's amazing. Wow. I, that's just so great. They're very positive that way. Like they just admired everyone. And so what I feel like my psyche did not get programmed in a comparison mindset at all. Like it was just like, wow, that's so awesome. I'm so happy for you. And so I've only really only had like a few moments in life where I've like been like, I've noticed I'm like, Oh, why does she have that? She's not even good. And I'm like, Whoa, right. uh, uh, like I want to vomit. Cause I'm like, what is going on in me? Like, that's not a familiar energy. And I've always, I, I I've nailed it. It's like, Oh, you, 
you think you're not going to be successful in that area. And so you're that you're like using that to almost like beat yourself up there. Like just be right. happy for her, which is my normal. I'm always like, I'm just happy for people Right. when you, when you can get to that place, then you can focus on what you want to create. Like what, how do, exactly. how do you want your body to be your fitness to be your business to be like, who gives a shit what mm -hmm. the other people are doing? But yeah, that, that it takes work, especially if you had comparison and not enoughness modeled yeah. in your subconscious when you were a little kid, holy crap. And like, you, I know you had to have had that. You grew up in like LA, like celebrity oh land. Like I cannot even imagine. Yeah. You know, so that's a big one. Okay. Yeah. And you know what? I just want to say really quickly, that is your gift. Like that is your, that is, well, you have many gifts, but one of your yeah. gifts really is seeing the beauty in everyone. Like I remember we were in, when we were in Tulum, we went on a trip to Tulum together. You like looked at me and I'm not a fitness. I'm probably like, you know, I'm an average weight. And I was in my bikini and you were like, damn girl, I want your legs. Like I want your butt. And I'm yeah. like, you know, I'm not a fitness model, but I was like, you said that to me. And I was like, damn, Tara just told me she likes my butt and my leg. And you knew it was true. You're like, yeah, I have a nice butt. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, I, know. I can't help but identify the positives in people. And I'm really grateful to my parents for that. Cause it was just always modeled. Yeah. You know, it was just, it's just my, my mind just subconsciously scans for it. And it's like, dad, ah, that's cool about you. So, I love that about you. You're so good at that. <laughs> um, okay. I want to tell you another really common type of shame that I see coming up a lot. And that is shame from unwanted exposure. That is a really big one. What does that so mean? So that's when one, it's when one of your secrets comes out or something oh. about you comes out that you don't want other people to know about, like you're being exposed. Yeah. yeah. Um, that would and be scary. so that's scary. And I see that a lot from people, especially when like their habits are being revealed, like say they're drinking too much right. and that's brought to the surface. Right. Infidelity. I mean, right. the list goes on and on, but that's a really common one that I see. Mm, yeah. They're not ready yet to face that. And that, God, that probably that, I mean, that is resemblant of why people don't talk. It's that same energy of like, I don't want other people to know this about me because fill in the blank. Yeah. They're going to think I'm a bad person, blah, 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 blah. Kind of yeah. tied in with the first one too, the societal shame. Totally. Yeah. Totally. But really at the bottom, I mean, I'm telling you in that episode that I just mentioned, I go through all of them, yeah. but at the root of it is a feeling of inadequacy, a yeah. feeling of just being flawed, um, yeah. being bad. So that's the core of all different types of shame. It's like, I'm not good enough. Something about yeah. me is wrong. There's yeah. something wrong with me. Right. Yeah. And that, like compassion, I think is so crucial. Like it's, you know, if we look at a little kid and they're acting a certain way, you kind of know it's like, well, where did they learn that? Right. You know, like I, it's, I feel like it's easier. That's why I love inner child work. Will you show them for anybody watching on YouTube, what you've got there in front of you? Yeah. Thank you. So I Sorry. Is that it, unwanted exposure? No, <laughs> no. Cause I think, it, right? I think it's something that everyone should do honestly. Um, so I keep this in front of me when I record any of my podcast episodes or go on any, actually I keep it in front of me all the time. Will so you explain is, for the people on audio what you're holding? Yeah. Up? So this is my seventh grade school picture. I'm 12 years old. Do I look the same? So um, cute. Yes. You look the same. And it says, make her proud, like a really big sign that I've written. So it's my Love seventh that. grade picture and it says, make her proud. And really, you know, that's my motivation because when I was going through all the tough stuff, I think beneath it, I just felt like, man, like I would be so disappointed in myself. How did I get here? You know, that was when things were really dark. And now my motivation is I want to make my 12 year old self proud. I want her to think I'm a badass, and I'm like, I'm strong and, you know, yeah, so I keep yeah. that in front of me and it's a powerful reminder always. Yes. I love that so much. I, I was sharing with Kate, if anybody's watching on YouTube, you can see that I also still have a picture of me as a little kid. I got a bunch of notifications, so you can't see it, but I got a little picture of me, um, as a little kid for my higher retreat that I just did. And like, so I'm like probably what, like six in this picture. So like that. cute. <laughs> and I, we did a, a inner child meditation with the yoga instructor and it just, so is just what you just said. I, I, I mean, I'll share this. <laughs> it's kind of like sounds cocky or something, but it's just what I felt like I, she had us imagine that our inner child was sitting next to us. 
Right. And that the older version of, of us was on the other side, which I know you can relate to because you do some tricks with that and yourself yeah. too. Um, and I imagine little me sitting next to me and I imagine her looking over at me and going, that's me. I'm so cool. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and I was like, cool, dude. It was just like really good feeling with myself. And like that is so crucial on like when we're judging ourselves, ashamed of things, it's like, Oh my gosh, give yourself a huge, huge, like freaking gallon of compassion. Just keep pouring gallons of compassion on yourself because like there's, there's wounds and, and it's stories we believe about ourselves that lead us into this place of shame. Like nothing about your story is shameful to me at all. It is like (laughs) so much compassion. It's like this little girl who was scared that had some traumatic things that never got dealt with. And now the subconscious runs a show and it's fear and shame and guilt and all this stupid stuff. That's like, no, that's not fair to little Kate, you know? So thank you. No, I just got the chills when, when you talked about what your inner child said to you in that meditation, because I've told you this story. I did uh, an exercise where I imagined just like you said, talking to eight-year-old Kate, right? Eight-year-old Kate. And I just told her, she was looking at me with just like, like, is everything going to be okay? Like, is everything going to work out? And I said, I said to her, Kate, you will never believe the person you're going to become. You're going to have some hard years, but you will never believe how strong you will be. And that's so freaking needed. Yeah. Powerful. And Kate, you were going to be a comedian. Remember? Yeah, I was going to be a comedian. You're going to NYU on that track. And it's like, well, you're, you can't help. You've developed the skill. And once you have the skill of being funny, you just can't (laughs) not be okay. So like Kate is always making us laugh. And what's so cool is like, I mean, being a comedian would have been like cool and all that, but like now because of that pain that you went through, look what you get to do now, because you choose to use it, to lift your, put your hand back and help other people come out. Like I'm sorry, but that's way freaking, I, I, in my personal opinion, it's way freaking yeah. cooler than just being a comedian and like, can I get on this show and that show and blah, blah, blah. Like there's so much freaking purpose. Right. In it. You know, and I struggled with that and you know, I struggled yes. with that. I struggled with it. Like I abandoned my dreams. Like yeah. I had the belief of my trauma. Okay. This is a, a limiting belief that I had yeah. my trauma sobered my playfulness. So I believed for a long time that I couldn't be funny anymore, that everything had to be serious and dark and heavy. But as I've grown to love and accept my story, it's like my sense of humor has come back. You know, I'm, I become extroverted again. Whereas when I was living in shame, I was very introvert. I was very in my head. Even my taste in music has changed. Like I listened to like this, like dark, Ab- obscure music when I was in yeah. my shame years. And now I'm like back in like the pop, you know, like yeah. let's like dance and have fun. Yeah. And so, You're reintegrated with your inner child. You know, she's like back right. and alive and a well and well in you. And, um, you kind of hit on this for a second, but this is like fresh from this morning. So I don't know if you're willing to share this, but you found some binders from when you were in, uh, what do you call it? like rehab rehab. Yes. <laughs> and you shared with, uh, you just shared with me this morning that you felt like you wrote something like it's always going to be this way. Like if something, yeah. can you, what did you say? Um, yeah. So I'm moving and I'm packing up my apartment. I've lived here for six years and I'm just finding stuff that I totally forgot existed. And one of the things that I found when I was packing last night was this huge binder from when I went to rehab. I was in rehab for three and a half months. And like I said, I learned DBT there and I found all these worksheets where I was just, I don't remember writing them. I was so out of it. But one of the beliefs that I wrote that I was trying to flip was there will only be pain. I will only know suffering. Mm -hmm. And I also wrote stuff like, you know, I had to list out red flags for when I knew I was doing not so great. And I wrote that, like, when I stop showering, I know that my mental health isn't doing well. When I start lying, when I feel paranoid, all of this stuff that I can't even imagine identifying with anymore. Right. But it felt so permanent at that time. 
it felt so permanent. This is just the way it is. Showering sucks. Like who needs to shower? I don't want to go outside. People are out to get me. That's where my thinking was at during those years. I was and paranoid. So much com- right. And so much compassion. Cause like your neurotransmitters were like effed from yeah. all of that stuff that you had gone through. Right. So you're going to feel like that and it's going to feel permanent. And I just thank you for sharing that. Cause it's like, we get like that. My kids get like that sometimes. Like if they're in a bad mood and upset, it's just like life sucks. Right. Like, or, you know, one of the siblings is being mean to another one. It's like, my family is the worst, you know, it's like this, like super, we get stay, we're still like that. We're still like that as adults. We still get into these modes of like, this is just how life is right. Freak man. If like that version of you could just have had like a little kaleidoscope or something (laughs) where it could just see for a second right now, you'd be like, Oh, okay. Oh my God. Stop. (laughs) That just gave me chills. Yeah. I I mean, I I'm so proud after seeing that binder. I'm I'm just amazed that like that I don't even remember being that way hardly. So seeing that binder in my sloppy handwriting from those years, finding it last night, yeah, it was, it was surreal Tara. Like it was, it was really surreal. And I you're, to- that's, I think this is like a great way to, I still have one more thing I want to bring up, but like semi close this is like, you're like a standing, we both are right. I think that's what we resonate a lot on a soul level, but like, but you are a, like that beacon that you were looking for when you were in that place, like you've become that. That's my motivation. Yeah. It's like, I just want people to know that that's not the end. You can heal. You can come out of it. You actually can turn this into purpose in your life. If you so choose to Right. like, it's so awesome. You're talking about like your skin and stuff. You're like over there glowing. You're only 30. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> You're all- <laughs> oh, thank you. I'll be 31 in two months. <laughs> but oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I just told someone that I just told someone that I was like, look what I've done with that. Like, cause she yeah. felt like she could never get out the whole her. Right. She had a similar story to me. And she was like, the rest of my life is ruined. I've had a D like she was right. saying she'd right. had a DUI. She'd done this, that, and the other. I was like, girl, look what I did with that. I literally used it to become my purpose. I literally used it as a platform. I turned it into a platform yes. and a mission. Yes. And so it's, you don't, yeah, go it, ahead. Ignite, it ignites your soul. Yeah. 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 And it's like, and you wouldn't have that without the pain. Right. So I know people have heard of like turning your pain into purpose and I don't mean to be cliche, but like freak man, like it, it literally makes you grateful that right. you went through all that stuff so that you can, right have this fulfilling life experience of being able to help potentially millions of other people who've been in the same boat. Anyone can do that. Anyone can do that. You don't have to have a speaking gift. You don't have to be like the most athletic person in the room. Like just owning, owning your story. Yes. And however that that's how you become a hero. That's how you become. Yeah. And you don't have to, you don't even have to have a podcast or become a coach or like any of this stuff, because Mm -hmm. I just witnessed that the retreat I just hosted there I just was like, God, I love the universe. Like I felt like everyone was so intuitively guided there because there would be some one person who's struggling with addiction right now. And another person who has healed their addiction and they're sitting there talking. He's not a coach. He's not, right. he doesn't have a podcast. He's just healed that side of himself and just who he is naturally is healing to the other person, right. you know? And like, exactly. like let's say some, a woman who's never had a healthy masculine energy in her life, just being around a man who has put in healing work and his healthy masculine energy is healing. So just being around it, like just the nuanced things, you know, I had a client say that the the repelling guy, the guy that took us canyoneering, she's like, his energy was so healing to me because instead of being like, Oh, stop being a baby, but you know, stuff that she's been exposed to in her life, it was, it's okay. It's a, it's totally understandable how you feel here. Let me help you. Like just that energy of that healed man was healing to her. So as we do dive into this work, you literally can't help, but become a healer in little nuanced ways in your life. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's so, it's so funny because I think that telling your shame story or talking about trauma or things you've buried, there's like a three way impact, right? Mm. First of all, you're helping yourself come to terms with it. Second of all, like I said, you're creating a safe space for others to share. But third of all, there's this preventative quality that you're giving other people by sharing this. Like say you've been abused and a lot of people who have been physically abused, there's shame around that, right? right? They don't like to talk about it. 
but say that shame didn't exist. They could be giving warning signs to someone who is currently in an abusive relationship or someone who's just starting to see abusive stuff from their partner. They're, they're serving like as the red flag, like, Hey, I went through this. And then the person going through it says, Oh shit, I'm going through that too. Right. Because that shame didn't exist. So they could talk about it. It saved someone else. Wow. So So good. There's like three levels. There's three levels. It's yourself opening the safe space for someone else, and then creating awareness that can prevent someone else from ever having to experience that shame. Damn. That's so big. That's such a great point. Yeah. (laughs) Thanks. Yeah. I love it. Okay. Okay. (laughs) The last thing I wanted to bring up was, is your journal because I've actually like already been telling, uh, my (laughs) certain people that come into my life. I'm like, I don't know, go to my friend Kate's website and download her shame journal. It's really good. Can you tell them about that? Yeah. So really good. Thank you. Thank you. I finished it at your house too. I know. That's how I I know. (laughs) Finished writing it at your house. Um, yeah. So I've created a seven day journal to begin identifying thoughts that are causing you shame and begin coming up with ways to flip those thoughts of shame. So it's a seven day exercise. I've tried everything in the books, just like you've said, I've been on prescription medications. I've done every therapeutic modality. I'm not just saying that I literally have. Um, and so what I've done is I've created a cliff notes version of all of these things that took tens of thousands of dollars for me to totally cultivate. And I've condensed them into a one week journal. Now I know people all the time are like, go to my website and download my ebook, download this. They're all great. That's amazing. I'm telling you though, I put everything I've learned from that dark, 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 dark place in my life and just put it into this because I want to give it back. I want to give someone the tools to start. Yeah, it, no, it's so good. It reminds me of the DBT. It, I'm sure you have some hints of that in there. It's just like yes. awareness of like what is actually happening inside of me. Yeah. And I, I love workbooks. I say all the time, I'm like, if you're just listening to stuff, you're not actually doing the actual work. You're, right. you're educating yourself, which is cool. And that's yeah. good. And some things come to mind, but until you pull something out of you right. and actually make it tangible, like figure out what is happening inside of you, like that's where the work happens. Right. So, and you know, I tell people, Tara, I'm like, you don't even have to do the seven days. You don't even have to do the journal, yeah. but if you look at it and see the questions that right. are being asked, you might right. be able to, in your subconscious, put them in there and just yeah. have greater awareness throughout your day. So you don't even have to do it. Just look at the questions. Yeah. Although yeah. I do recommend doing it. Yes, I do too. And I have to just say, just cause like the style of everything you're doing, cause Kate's an artist too. So like every, it, everything is like fun and cool and there like, it's go. like enjoyable your website, kategeller.com and it's E R yeah. guys. It's two E's and Geller, um, mm-hmm. kategeller.com. It's like so enjoyable. It's like, it's all these sides of you, your child self. Cause Kate also has all these accents. She's like, she could also be a voice actress. Cause you're really That's good a at it. Dream. That's yeah. A dream. <laughs> really, really I just good. I want to talk like this for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> she's just so she has like a bunch. It, it, it's not, it's, you can tell that you could have done like the TV, you know, comedian thing, because you also like become that person really well. Like you have that like actor <laughs> side to you, Thank you. Thank like, your you. whole personality change. It's freaking cool. But it, you've brought that into this. Like, so it's like fun and enjoyable, your website, like your story. If you guys want to see her yeah. pictures from before, like what we're talking about, like, it's really powerful. Like if you're just looking Thank at Kate you. right now, I don't think you can quite understand like what she's talking about. The pictures tell the story and you are, and you're a writer, like you're this yeah. super talented person, but the Thank way you, you write it's just, it's fun and enjoyable to read. So if you're like feeling shame in anywhere in your life. And I know you all got them in there somewhere. It's either something you did or just who you are. You just don't think you're good enough of a person or your body or something like that. Like it's so healing because you're doing now uh, for like what people did for you of like, Hey, hey, we have shit too. Like, it's okay. Like, come here, come here, come here. Let's talk about it. It's all good. Let's put some compassion on that and like, love it and see your potential and your purpose. Like you've done that really well through the website. So kategeller.com, the, the journal is on there. Highly recommend getting that. And then your podcast, shame on shame. It's so good, girl. You're already killing it. She's already like hitting rankings. I mean, how many episodes are you in right now at the time of recording this? 12 episodes in. Yeah. So So probably be like around 20 or something by the time this comes out. But it's, yeah, I mean, you already, you hit like rankings after like the first few episodes. So I hit rankings after four episodes on the mental health category. So it's so good. 
And I want to say too, like when I tell my story on podcasts like this, the energy can sometimes be darker, right? Because my story is very dark, but in all of the work I'm doing in my podcast on my website, like I try and keep everything light and fun and, you know, as positive as possible. So if you check out my podcast, which I hope you do, um, you can expect that. I don't want to like suck anyone's energy. So I really bring that like funny yeah, yeah. And fun and very self-aware. Like, yeah. I love how you, you'll, you'll catch yourself saying something that's like funny. You'll just laugh at yourself, you know, like it's, <laughs> it's, it's really enjoyable to listen to. So it's definitely check that out. You guys and follow her on TikTok and Instagram. It's Kate on shame anywhere else you want to send them. Kate, that's really it. You covered all, right. all the bases. Thank you for coming Thanks on so much for having me. I'll text you in a few minutes. Okay. I'll text you in a few minutes. <laughs> Love you. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed. I know you enjoyed. Kate is such a gift. Thank you for being so brave and courageous. Cause I've watched you go through these levels of like, ugh, like that discomfort. And you're like, Nope, if I'm, I've got to do it. I got to do it. Like the, your desire to help is insane. So thank you for being thank so you. brave, it means courageous. So much. And, yeah. Thank you. Proud it means you. so, so much for me to be on your podcast that it's like gotten <laughs> to this point. Like I'm honored. I love you so much. Thanks so girl. Thank you for making me feel so special. And thank you. I'm honored too. And I know p- people will be requesting you come back on later. So after your <laughs> Ted talk and your book and all that stuff, we'll have you come back on. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Sounds good. Bye.